Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kevin Wilson. I'm the Director of Public Policy for the American Society for Cell Biology. Our guest today is Dr. Kathleen Giacomini. She is a professor of, uh, pharma of biopharmaceutical sciences, cellular and molecular pharmacology, and pharmaceutical chemistry at the University of California, San Francisco. She received her PhD in pharmaceutics at, from State University of New York at Buffalo, and she completed her postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford University. Her research group focuses on, and I don't want to steal her thunder, so I'm going to be careful here. Her research group focuses on uh, something called membrane transporters, which facilitate the flux of drugs in important natural compounds into and out of cells. Her research addresses three questions. What is the, what is the role of membrane, membrane transporters in drug absorption and disposition? How does genetic variation in membrane transporters affect clinical drug response? And what are the structural determinants of specificity of membrane transporters? And I'm not sure whether she'll answer all of these questions, but I'll turn it over to Dr. Gia Kamini. Actually won't. Thank you. OK, so really, today what I'm going to be talking about is the field of pharmacogenomics and um, personalized medicines. Um, and what I'm going to do is focus largely on research that's going on in my laboratory towards the end, but actually research that's going on around the country and around the world in the area of personalized medicines. Um, and before I do, though, I'll give you a little bit about what's going on in terms of translating research discoveries to drug therapy right now in, uh, in, in real time. So let me make sure I get this one right. Yeah, so let me begin by, first of all, acknowledging the funding for this research, for my research as well as research in pharmacogenomics around the country. So around 2000, uh, in the era when the human genome uh, was uh, published, um, the NIH uh, decided to establish a research network in the area of personalized medicines or pharmacogenomics with the idea that there was a lot of information now out there about the genome, and now let's learn about how we can use that information to think about drug therapies. Um, and so they funded a pharmacogenetics research network. That network um, consists of centers um, around, uh, sorry, centers around uh, the country, um, and each one of them may be focused on a particular disease, for example, asthma or cancer, um, or some centers, like my own center, is focused on a class of proteins that spans disease states. And our, the whole network is called the PGRN, Pharmacogenetics Research Network. It was, it's led by NIGMS, it's NIH, but that institute, Jeremy Berg, Mike Rogers, and uh, Rochelle Long were the leaders. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge people who have worked on the projects that I'll be talking about today, Yan Chu, Deanna Kretz, Tom Farron, Rich Castro, and Claire Brett, who are in my own team. Um, and then I want to uh, say a word about Yusuke Nakamura, uh, and I will be talking about global consortia as we go, because when you enter into the field of pharmacogenetics, one of the key challenges is getting sufficient numbers of patients on a particular drug and pooling uh, a groups of investigators and institutes together uh, to get the kind of information you need to make the discoveries. And so we're working uh, with Yusuke Nakamura uh, in Japan. Um, and I also want to acknowledge here at the beginning that we use a lot of NIH resources, HapMap, Genome Browser, um, and large clinical trials, which are funded by the NIH, become very important resources for us to start to identify genetic factors for why people differ in their response uh, to drugs. Okay, so now let me begin with the problem. So there are two problems when one uh, gives a drug. Of course, response is not one of them, but one of the big problems is adverse drug reactions. And as you know, adverse drug reactions can be benign, but can also be quite severe. For example, a fatal bleeding event from an anticoagulant, such as warfarin. That's a severe adverse drug event. Um, and also, the other problem in drug therapy is a whole lot of people who are taking drugs may be, in some cases, unbeknownst to the individual, are not really responding to that drug. So the issue of non-response uh, takes a hidden health toll um, on the American people and on people worldwide who are on uh, drugs. Um, so I'll tell you an example of non-response uh, as I go. 
Um, now, there are a variety of reasons why um, people may differ in their response to drugs and why people may experience an adverse drug event or non-response. Um, and some of those reasons have nothing to do with genetics. It may be drug-drug interactions. The individual may be on two drugs that are ones causing an interaction with the other drug. It may be the fact that they smoke or they drink alcohol. It could be the food. Um, there are all sorts of, um, there are disease states. There are all sorts of other factors that are not related to genetics that will influence response to drugs. And in the end, we need to put all that information together if we're going to select the right drug for uh, the right individual. But my talk today will focus on the genetic factors and trying to get a handle on what they are. But in the question and answer session, I'm happy to talk about other factors because we also think about those in our uh, research. Um, so that's what this says. Um, so the goal of research in pharmacogenetics is identify genetic risk factors for adverse uh, drug events and non-response. And importantly, after we've done that, or sometimes before, discover the biological mechanisms that underlie human disease and drug response. And I'll give you examples of why that's important and what we're doing there and what's going on around the world there. Um, the idea, of course, at the end of the day is that we have the individual's genome. We know something about the genetic variants that individuals carry. Um, and using that information together with other information to personalize drug therapy. So that's the goal. Um, okay, so lots of hype. Um, what's really happening? What has actually happened in the, er in the area of pharmacogenomics or personalized medicine? So I thought what I'd do uh, would be tell you a little bit about what the FDA has been doing in changing labels of existing drug products to indicate that there are genetic tests available um, to help guide therapy. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, and then, of course, focus on, on the research that's going on so you'll get an idea of what's coming down the pipe. So let me start with the FDA-led label changes. So the FDA has had advisory committee meetings since around 2003 focused in the area of pharmacogenetics. And they've now changed the label on six drug products, or they're about to change it. There's one of them that's still, I think, pending, but the advisory committee has recommended a label change. What does the label, what has the label been changed to say? Well, for most of these drugs, uh, the label change will be something like, um, this drug may cause an adverse drug event in your patient. Um, you may wish to administer a genetic test. Genetic tests are available for your use in guiding therapy, and then there might be some more about that. So it's not a mandate. You do, the physicians do not have to administer the genetic test, and the whole issue of who's going to pay for those tests is something we can also talk about in the Q&A session. But, um, but, the, but it's now changed. And, I, and before 2003, None of this information was on the official product label. So I would say this is a pretty big change because there are now six products out there that, um, that there is some information that genetic tests may guide therapy. Now I'm going to give you, oh, and I, I'm indicating also that the NIH-funded PGRN investigators were part of the study teams here for a number of the uh, findings that, of the, uh, the underlying discoveries that this genetic variant did associate with a particular adverse drug reaction, for example. So let me tell you the tamoxifen story. I thought I'd pick one of these and, and tell you a little bit about what that story is about um, and how a genetic test may indeed help guide therapy here. So tamoxifen, as you know, is a drug used to treat estrogen-positive breast cancer. And it's used by millions of women in, in, in the United States and, and, and around the world. This is a um, highly prescribed drug for usually the prevention of recurrence of uh, breast cancer. Um, a PGRN investigator, um, uh, a f I don't know, uh, some years ago, discovered that tamoxifen was uh, inactive. That was known as a prodrug. So it itself, when you take tamoxifen, it's inactive. And it must be converted or activated. And it's converted to an active compound by 
uh, two different enzymatic steps. And what's the active drug in tamoxifen is indoxifen. So tamoxifen itself isn't active, but indoxifen is. And these two enzymes sequentially will convert tamoxifen to the active t uh, indoxifen. Turns out that one of these enzymes, CYP2D6, is polymorphic. So what does that mean? That means that people in this room may have different forms, genetic forms of CYP2D6. And one of those forms, there are several forms, but one of them is inactive. So if you happen to carry what's called the CYP2D6 star 4 allele, um, uh, and remember, you're getting one version of CYP2D6 from your mother and one from your father. So if you happen to carry two of the STAR4 allele, those are totally inactive enzymes. So what will happen to individuals who are homozygous for the STAR4 allele or carry uh, both copies is um, they won't make very much indoxifen. So um, here's a woman um, taking tamoxifen for her breast cancer. And maybe unbeknownst to her, she carries two star-4 alleles. Oh, how common is that? Homozygotes for star-4 in the Caucasian population who have two copies, it's 10%. So, you know, 10% of women are taking this with two copies of the star-4 allele, and they're not getting very high levels uh, of endoxifen. And let me show you the data that support that. So here are endoxifen levels uh, in women who are taking therapeutic doses of tamoxifen. And here are individuals who have the common form of CYP2D6, two copies, one from their mom and one from their dad. And here are the individuals who have the two, uh, two star four alleles. And you can see endoxifen levels are less than half of what they are uh, in people with the normal um, CYP2D6. So these women are clearly on the drug and not getting the... Uh, any, the therapeutic levels, their, their sub-therapeutic levels is what they're getting for uh, endoxifen. Now, what happens to their relapse-free um, uh, survival? Let's have a look at that. So those are, these are some studies done by Getz um, at Mayo Clinic. And here is, um, um, I have to watch this, I'm uncoordinating, I keep hitting the forward button. So here are, here are some data showing survival uh, in women, relapse-free survival. So this is where they're surviving without any evidence of the disease. And as you can see, over time, um, you know, so women will, their breast cancer will recur. But if they have the um, STAR4, two copies, they're homozygous for the STAR4 allele, um, they don't do nearly as well. Um, and, and clearly, they're being... Uh, uh, not, not treated very well. They're being under-treated. Um, so now the FDA is considering, I don't know if that label has taken effect, um, a label change to indicate that, you know, before you give tamoxifen, you may want to genotype um, your patients and understand whether they have CYP2D6 star 4 alleles. Now, I said that star 4 allele was, the, was found. It's an inactive CYP2D6 allele. It's found in Caucasians, but each ethnic group has their own inactive or low active allele. So there's one in Japan, and Jap Japan, the Japanese people have just replicated these findings in Japan with their own CYP2D6 inactive alleles, women on tamoxifen. Um, and then we have African Americans that have their own alleles. So um, it's, it's, it's quite an important finding. Okay. Um, so now let me go to research, which is ongoing, and I thought I would first tell you about the kind of research that's going on um, uh, around the country called genome-wide association studies, um, in which we're trying to discover genetic risk factors for human disease first, and then also for drug response. So... Um, let me begin with, let's say we want to discover what genetic factors predispose an individual to diabetes, let's say type 2 diabetes, for example. Um, we would take, and in this study they did take, 1,500 diabetic patients uh, with type 2 diabetes, let's say, and 1,500 control patients matched for the same ethnicity in and around the same clinics, and here the diabetic patients... Um, and the control patients, they get a blood sample and they get their DNA. And then what's done is they do genome-wide markers. And what they're really doing is they're measuring markers uh, on every chromosome um, 
and they're looking for differences in those markers. And they are, those are SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. So these are SNP chips. Um, and they're looking at, in this particular study, I think they looked at 550,000 markers around the genome, looking for any differences in any marker on any chromosome between the diabetic and the control populations, asking what's different. And let me show you what they found here. Um, and so here, carefully, here are some markers that differed. So for type 1 diabetes, differences between cases and controls, this was published last summer in Nature, uh, differences in cases and control were here on chromosome 6, big difference between cases and control and some other genetic differences that they're finding on different chromosomes. Now, what are these marking? You know, what genes are they marking? Those are the important mechanistic studies that need to be done before we can develop therapies or preventative strategies uh, for diabetes. And you can see they find different markers for type 1 versus type 2 uh, diabetes. Now, let me go on to show you that they've not only done these kinds of studies for diabetes, but um, they've also done the studies for a variety of other diseases. So you can clearly see, here's coronary artery disease. There's a big marker on uh, chromosome 9, um, which is different between the people with the coronary artery disease and uh, the control population. What's that? What's going on on chromosome 9? Why is it making people susceptible to coronary artery disease? Um, so the whole idea of, uh, of now that we're making these discoveries, figuring out what the genes are and what they're actually doing, that's where we're going to begin to affect therapy and preventative measures when, when we can do that. I also want to point out a couple of things here that I think you could see for yourself. Here's bipolar, and you don't see any big hits in bipolar. So what's going on there? That's interesting also. Is bipolar not genetic? Or um, is it genetic and the, gene, and, the, and the SNPs aren't on that 550,000 SNP chip? Maybe we have to do something and, and get a bigger SNP chip. Or perhaps it's genetic, but we've lumped up a bunch of patients, what we've called bipolar, but in fact there are subcategories of bipolar, and we need to somehow figure that out before we start to look for genetic markers. So there are a lot of issues here. Same with hypertension. Um, what's going on there? Not too many markers. But the main thing is we're finding a lot of these genetic markers, and we're going to begin to discover what are the biological implications of those markers and it, with respect to human uh, disease. Okay, now I'm going to advance from human disease to pharmacogenetics, okay? So now here we're interested in why people might experience an adverse drug reaction. And I'm going to give you data from Mary Relling at St. Jude's Children's Hospital uh, in Memphis. And what she's interested in is treating kids uh, and her group uh, with, uh, who have childhood leukemia. And one of the drugs that's used in the treatment of childhood leukemia is methotrexate. Um, methotrexate, unfortunately, causes a... Um, a um, a serious adverse drug event. It's a gastrointestinal toxicity, um, and Mary's described it to me so I could describe it to you, but it's a gastrointestinal toxicity which limits the dose of the drug. So if the child gets this kind of toxicity, they have to stop methotrexate until the, the toxicity resolves and reduce uh, the dose and, and go on. So it's a, what they call a dose-limiting uh, toxicity, and when you have these kinds of toxicities, um, they're not good because treatment for the leukemia, which you want to continue, has to stop. Um, and you might have to put the, drug, uh, the child on a drug that doesn't work, uh, for example, as well. Um, so she has done, she's taken cases, individuals um, on, um, on uh, methotrexate um, and then controls and done genome-wide association studies. And looking also for genetic markers, which may pre they're, both, they're all on methotrexate, but these are experiencing the adverse drug events. And looking for what's the difference between the kids, genetic markers, who experience the adverse drug event, um, and what about the ones who don't. And she also has identified um, a genetic markers here. And those markers are quite important also. 
So she's also now trying to discover the major challenge in discovering what genetic, what underlies those genetic markers in terms of disease um, and in terms of variation in this serious adverse drug event. And then you could imagine what could happen. You could administer a genetic test to these kids. If you knew that the person was susceptible to this gastrointestinal toxicity, start the therapy right. Don't wait until they get the toxicity and then have to withdraw, but maybe give them a lower dose or whatever one would have to do uh, to treat the patient correctly. Now, I want to now let you know that, okay, I've described some studies. I've told you about pharmacogenetics. I've told you about what's going on in, gene in genomic studies. And I want to now tell you about a global alliance that has been formed by the, uh, between the Pharmacogenetics Research Network and, um, and RIKEN um, and Yusuke Nakamura's Center for Genome Medicine in Japan. Um, and we're also, the Pharmacogenetics Research Network is also trying to form other global alliances. So we have got, PGRN investigators have gotten uh, cases and controls of people on a variety of different drugs who have experienced in general an adverse drug reaction. And now we're trying to identify genetic markers for that adverse drug reaction. So you can see drugs used in the treatment of breast cancer, um, warfarin and anticoagulant, drugs used which cause cardiac arrhythmias, pancreatic cancer drugs, et cetera. So there's six big uh, trials which are now going on. The, the, the patients have actually been collected. We have the DNA, and they're undergoing these genome-wide association studies. Besides these six, there are five more um, that have just been approved to go forward. So why do we need this collaboration? Those SNP chips are rather expensive, um, so they're like, I don't know, I'm just going to guess, something like maybe $500 a chip, a chip something. And um, so then imagine you've got 2,000 cases times $500. I, I can't do the math, but you can probably do the math. It's a lot of money. So you need to get people together um, uh, uh, who can also help fund, who are interested uh, in the studies, and also you need replication. If you find a genetic susceptibility risk factor, you want to replicate it in another study in case it just happened by chance you found such a factor. Okay. So now I'm going to go a little bit, change gears, and talk about some research on membrane transporters um, that are going on in my laboratory. So membrane transporters. I live and breathe membrane transporters. So there are 350 influx transporters in the human genome. What do these transporters do? They sit on plasma membranes and they bring into cells things cells might need. So what does a cell need? Vitamins, nutrients of all sorts, amino acids, glucose. Um, so there are 350 transporters doing a variety of different functions. Heavy metals, you need iron, you need a little bit of copper, etc. So there are a lot of transporters. And drugs, in general, to get into the body will use these same uh, transporters, um, because a drug may be structurally similar to some kind of a vitamin or, or an amino acid and therefore may use these kinds of transporters um, and uh, get in. So I'll talk about one of the transporters today, OCT1, Organic Cation Transporter 1. This is a very important transporter in the liver, in the human liver, um, and it takes in a variety of different drugs, um, and um, I'll tell you about that. So you need transporters. So probably one of the major determinants of drug response is drug levels. If you take a drug and you don't absorb it and you don't get it into your bloodstream, you're not going to respond to the drug. So you have to have drugs getting into the bloodstream and then also getting into the target tissues. The drug won't work if you're treating a patient for depression and the drug isn't getting into their brain for some reason. And so what? What mediates drug entry into the blood as well as into the target tissues are these membrane transporters. So you can imagine that genetic variation in these membrane transporters might be critical for variation in drug levels and ultimately variation in drug response. So that's what my group is working on, genetic factors uh, in membrane transporters. Now let me tell you about metformin, an anti-diabetic drug. You know it, maybe it's glucophage, it's advertised. Used for type 2 diabetes, it's now the 15th most prescribed drug in the United States. Um, but there's wide variation in response to metformin. So people, about 35% of people who are put on metformin, they try it for a period of time. It doesn't 
work and they have to either take them off metformin, put them on another anti-diabetic drug, or add another anti-diabetic drug. So it would be nice, again, to know beforehand who's likely to respond to metformin and who is likely not to respond to metformin. It would also be nice when you walk into the physician's office and you have type 2 diabetes that the physician doesn't say, hmm, any, many, miny, okay, we'll get, give you this one. It would be nice if they had a good reason for choosing one diabetic agent over uh, another one. So that's a problem that we're interested in, and we're going to tie that problem to that transporter, OCT1. But before I did, I thought I'd, I downloaded some slides showing you what an epidemic we have of obesity uh, in the country. So this is 1997. These are slides from the CDC. Um, these states here in TAN are states in which 20 to 25 percent of the adult population has a BMI greater than 30. So they're considered obese. So we have a number of states here. And in the royal blue, 15 to 20 percent of the adults um, um, are obese. Um, and then fast forward some four years later, in 2001, we have a whole lot of states now with 20 to 25 percent of the adults who are obese, and even one state with 25 to 30 percent of the adults obese. Now let's just go forward to 2007, and we have a major epidemic of obesity in this country. So although my area is pharmaceutical research, let us not forget the environmental effects on health. Um, and this certainly makes the point. Um, um, because of this epidemic of obesity, we have an epidemic of type 2 diabetes. And a lot of people are having to you know, be treated for type 2 diabetes. And although they go into the physician's office and the physician will say, you know, diet and exercise, a lot of people somehow can't do that, especially in this rich... Uh, food environment that we're in. So, um, so because of that, oh yeah, it's greater than 30 in those states. So because of that, metformin is widely prescribed, and as I said, there's a problem in predicting who's going to respond to the drug and who won't. So metformin exerts its pharmacologic action in the liver. What does it do there? It, that's where it has its anti-diabetic effect. And what is that? It inhibits glucose synthesis. So you have a lowering of blood glucose. That's the whole point in, in anti-diabetic therapy. You want to lower the blood glucose. So by inhibiting glucose synthesis, you can lower blood glucose. So metformin does that. And, um, and it gets into the liver, we feel, by this transporter, OCT1. Therefore, any genetic variation in OCT1 will make people respond differently. That's our hypothesis. So let me show you how we performed this hypothesis. We carried out first studies in mice, then we moved to humans. So what did we do with mice? Well, we fed mice what's called a Western diet for six weeks. A lot of pizza, cheese, you know, they were quite happy campers. They became diabetic. And so here's their fasting blood glucose levels. We're way up in the diabetic range. And... Uh, then we treated them with metformin, and they respond to metformin quite well. Then we took an OCT1 knockout mouse. So this is a mouse that's totally fine, but it doesn't have that transporter in the liver, OCT1. Um, and they also became diabetic, but when we treated them with metformin, they didn't respond. So that was good proof of concept that we could move into humans now and see how that hypothesis bore out. So um, what we did then was we, we have this cohort of people in the San Francisco Bay, Bay Area called SOFI. Um, what they've done is they've given us their DNA samples. There's around 500 of them. You know, we use around 250 of them um, from four ethnic groups. Um, they give us a blood sample, they give us their DNA, and they give us their contact information. So we can call them back in if we find something interesting and ask them very nicely if they would like to participate in a pharmacogenetic study. So I'll show you how we've used that population first to discover genetic variation in OCT1 and then all the way to carry out a clinical study. So let's first discover genetic variation in OCT1, which we did by resequencing the OCT1 gene. Um, in 250 uh, DNA samples from these ethnically diverse populations. So here is the secondary structure of OCT1. What you need to know is this is a summary slide, and those red balls are important, maybe important genetic variants. They're genetic variants that change amino acids, so they could be potentially important. Any person in this room may have this protein without any single genetic variant. You may just have it without any variant. Um, 
a lot of you probably have this variant because it's found in African Americans at 26%, Caucasians at 40%, also in Asian Americans. So some of these variants are quite common, and people walk around with those variants. And remember, you're having two OCT1 genes, one from your mom, one from your dad, so you may have it on one chromosome and not the other. Some of the variants we identified were personal or particular for a particular ethnic group. Um, that's the kind of data that we get for all of our membrane uh, transporters. So now you have to ask the question, okay, I have a genetic variant. How does that affect the uptake of metformin? So we moved to cellular studies. Um, and so here is the cellular uptake of metformin compared to cells expressing OCT1, the normal OCT1, no variants in it, compared to cells not expressing OCT1. You can see metformin loves uh, OCT1. It's taken up very avidly by OCT1. And then here are the data um, in, um, in for each one of those red balls or non-synonymous genetic variants. And you can see that a bunch of them take up metformin just normally, but there are a whole bunch of them that have reduced uptake of metformin. And uh, one of them in particular is found in an allele frequency of 20%. So a lot of people have this reduced function variant that will take up metformin at a lower rate. So, of course, now the question is, how do these people who carry these variants respond to metformin? So we used our SOFI cohort. We called the people back in, and we gave them metformin. They're not diabetics. Metformin will work in people who don't have diabetes. It will lower your glucose also. Um, and so we called in the people with the reference OCT1 and the people with any one of these reduced function variants. We gave them metformin, and then we gave them a glucose tolerance test. And here are the data very quickly. Um, so these are the glucose levels of the people after a glucose tolerance test who have the reference OCT1, and they were reduced, as should be, with metformin. This is with metformin on board. But the people with the OCT1 variants didn't have the same reduction in their glucose. So now what do we need to do? We're moving on. We've got mechanism here. We know what's going on. So now we're moving to large diabetic populations collaborating with Kaiser, um, the Veterans Administration Hospital, Japan, et cetera, to see if whether what we found in our normal volunteers may also occur in diabetic patients. Okay, so let me tell you two other research is issues. Non-coding regions of the genome. So 99% of the genome doesn't code for a protein like OCT1 or anything. It just doesn't code for anything, but there's a lot of variation in those regions. So scientists right now are focusing on what the non-coding regions of the genome are actually doing, and there's a lot of research going on now. Uh, because maybe variation in non-coding regions is leading to variation in human disease and drug response. Um, sequencing everyone's genome. We've all heard about, you know, the prices are going down. We're all going to have our genome, the hot entire genome, uh, on a little card here. What are we going to do with the, that kind of information that that is going to generate? And let me give you an example. At UCSF, they have a breast cancer clinic. A lot of women come in to the breast cancer clinic, and they want to know whether they're at risk, whether they have a BRCA1 uh, bad allele that puts them at risk for breast cancer. So they resequence BRCA1 uh, in these women, and they find that, well, they don't have those common bad forms of BRCA1. They've got something new. It's their own particular personal variant, because when we start resequencing everybody's genome, we're going to find new variants that people hadn't discovered in these projects. So now what do they tell the woman? Well, you don't have the bad allele, but, you know, you got something. So that kind of advice, how are we going to interpret that kind of information? That's coming when we start doing all these resequencing. Um, computational predictions, maybe. Um, that might help. Um, but we're going to have to devise other technologies and figure out how to interpret those kinds of data. Okay, summary. Um, genetic tests are now available for some drugs, and the FDA has led some label changes, and we'll probably see more with time. Research is ongoing, uh, example of response to metformin, large studies like the adverse drug reactions that I told you about in the consortium with uh, Recon. Challenges, we need large patient populations. We have to understand the biological mechanisms and indeed the systems we don't know anything about non-coding regions, or we're learning, but we don't know enough. Predicting the function of rare variants, that's a big challenge. Um, multiple data sets and data types, 
we're going to have to integrate everything, not just genetic factors, but take into account other kinds of issues when we predict variation uh, in drug response. And uh, that's it. So thank you very much. So this is really interesting research. And um, my question is, how does that translate into policy? Um, you know, particularly my interest in, is in the effects on healthcare expen expenditures. Um, you know, does this kind of research have the potential to lower healthcare expenditures, um, bend the cost curve, growth, you know, negative, or can it also potentially make a, a, a positive slope? Because you know, if, if you imagine these SNP chips can be really expensive, and um, you said that you know, 10% of the uh, breast cancer drug, 10, only 10% have that uh, that allele, and so does that. You still have to pretty much you know code for the entire population that has breast cancer to know whether the drug is going to work. Um, but how do you offset that with the cost of you know prevention of an entire population and the benefit of a smaller population? Yeah, so I feel that's an important question. And as you know, when you're in the hospital, they're running all sorts of tests. You know, they're checking your sodium, checking your potassium, and all of this. And um, my own personal feeling is you do a genetic, if you do a SNP chip on you or me, we only have to do it once. You know, you've got your genetics, and it's going to stay with you, you know, throughout your life. So in terms of a person's lifelong you know, if they did the test every time they give a drug, you know, every time, that may add, it just depends, you know, in the, in the case where people are being sent to, for example, the ICU because they're having a fatal bleed because they got the dose wrong. Uh, my feeling there, like warfarin right now, there are two SNPs um, that they're looking at that they can then get the dose closer, the first dose. So warfarin's an anticoagulant. They give that to people, and they don't know exactly what dose to start you with, so they give you, you know, they base it on your body weight and maybe your gender. They give you a dose, and they send a number of people to the ICU because they get too much, and they start bleeding. A genetic task, to me, to get the dose closer would be, could be enormous benefit. So in that case, I think it could be very cost-effective. So maybe it's case by case, but also if you could just do this test once or get your genome once, You'd have it as part of your medical record, and then it might be also very costly. Well, it's one, sorry, it's one SNP chip for one disease. Like, if you want to do, how big would a SNP chip have to be yeah, if you yeah. to pull? Yeah, so, so what they're doing, yeah, they ran the same SNP chip on those seven diseases. It's just 550,000 DNA markers, so they just run it. Now they know. Well, if they run it on you or me, now we've got our markers. Now, admittedly, 550,000 may not be enough, but, you know, at some point they will come to a point where they sequence our genome, and then that'll be it. So it might end up being okay. But I don't think about that. Yes? Uh, I'm Rush Holt. I'm Hi. a representative from Central New Jersey and one of the co-sponsors, oh. uh, the co-chairs of this. And uh, no. Thank you for your presentation. Let me follow on that because, uh, um, you know, admittedly, the purpose of these lunchtime uh, seminars is to uh, promote investment in NIH research. <laughs> I mean, there's uh, no secret there. Uh, I'd like you to, to say a little bit about, you know, not just that we need more money for NIH research, but a little bit about how we decide uh, what we should be doing, what we should be investing in research. Uh, I, I don't know whether you have any thoughts on the, the relative importance of uh, private sector pharmaceutical company research relative to NIH research. There's quite a bit of debate about whether uh, NIH research uh, is only benefiting the pharmaceutical companies and therefore should have been paid for by them in the first place. Um, some of these policy questions that, that this uh, person was getting at, this questioner was getting at before. I, I don't know whether you have thoughts in those general policy areas, but if you do, I, I'd like to hear it. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Broad question, but yes, yeah, something that, that we do think about. So NIH, as you know, funds a lot of basic research, and some of the basic research that it funds then goes up on websites that the pharmaceutical industry can then take advantage of in developing their drugs. So I consider that good. 
you know, because it's now helping researchers everywhere, and then people can develop drugs uh, and think about how to use existing drugs, like these anti-cancer drugs, better. So I would feel the basic research component of NIH is quite important. The funding, the private sector, you don't mean government funds for the private sector, but, you know, how do we interact with the private sector? Because they do develop the drugs. Often the academic institutions aren't developing a new drug. It's the private sector. So partnerships, I feel, with the private sector between NIH and between academic institutions and pharmaceutical industry, I think, is quite important. For example, um, I'm talking to someone at some company because they've done a lot of genetics. So in their phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials, they'll collect DNA. Their drug may fail. It never makes the market. There they are sitting on these DNA samples. Um, it's in their, in their, you know, in the, in the back. Well, they don't want to give it out, and they don't know what to do with it, and it's a drug that failed. We could learn a lot, particularly about an adverse drug reaction. If we could work together and, you know, this drug is never going to go forward, we could learn a lot. So some kinds of discussion and partnerships, I think, are very important to move the field forward. If academics just keep talking to each other and don't, do, and don't talk to the industry, that's also an important thing. So I, I feel that's important. And then bringing in the FDA, I don't know if you were here for the beginning of my talk, but I showed FDA... Uh, guided uh, label changes um, where they take in the information that is published and they will recommend label changes um, to drugs. I think that's an important part that we ought to think about, um, you know, thinking more about the existing data in the literature and what to do about current drugs on the market and, um, and, 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 and maybe how to fund that kind of translational research. So those are some of my thanks. yeah thanks. Yep, there and there. I'd like to ask uh, a specific question, a general question, a specific question is about Libitor and statins, which I think is widely described. My understanding is it's a very good thing for 95 to 99 percent of the people, but roughly three percent do have a serious adverse reaction. And my specific question is: Is there any research on that? My more general question is: How do you choose? Which ones of the many, many diseases or drugs or whatever that you want to study? How do you tell which ones are likely to be genetic and which ones are likely to be environmental or something else? Okay, so two important questions. So the statins, the muscle toxicity, has caused a big uh, problem with a certain small fraction of folks. And so there's now been a study just published in the New England Journal where they did one of these genome-wide association studies on muscle toxicity, and they found a big hit there. And guess what? It's a transporter. Wouldn't I know it? Um, so um, yeah, it's a transporter that may bring the statin into muscle. They're not exactly sure what it's actually doing to but a genetic variant there is playing a role in that kind of toxicity. It would be nice if people had that information so they knew they could safely go on a statin um, before they, you know, had to endure the muscle toxicity. Uh, and the second part of your question is choice of research areas and how to decide on whether a particular drug response may have a genetic basis. So that's real hard. Because, you know, you know that a disease runs in your family. You know that in your family you might have cancer, you might have something. But drug response, well, guess what? Your new drugs, you don't know whether your uncle responded to a drug differently or not. So it's hard to know whether there's a genetic basis for that. So I always try to pick drugs where, as I think, and I sit with my postdocs and graduate students, we think about drugs where if there were a genetic test, it would guide therapy. You know, you could eliminate a, per a period of time where people were tri trial and error. You could do something useful. And, you know, so we, we, I'm sure other researchers are doing the same because they're focusing on drugs where if there were a genetic test, you could eliminate an adverse drug event or at least reduce it a lot, or you could predict who was going to respond to the drug better. So it, you do make those choices even at the very basic end. So, and with genetics, well, they seem to be quite important, so. Okay. Uh, you had a question first, so. Uh, my name is Daryl Pritchard, I'm with the Biotechnology Institute Organization. Okay. I just wanted to follow up on the conversation we were having uh, following the congressman's question. Um, you mentioned NIH funding, and of course, uh, 
it's crucial for industry to be able to take research in the bottom market development to, to determine these, in, in your case, membrane transport, but all these different bottom markets that can indicate uh, a different variability in or susceptibility in disease or variability in drug response. But on top of that, we're working uh, to work out the uh, oversight guidelines with the FDA and other uh, agencies within HHS um, that uh, will help bring forth these technologies. Um, and I guess my question is, as we try to develop those, that oversight mechanism and those guidelines, um, I think we need to point at specific case examples that provide a terrific example of the value of personalized medicine. And I think that leads to, uh, for the most part, getting something that will avoid a certain toxic reaction, mm -hmm. will help avoid uh, a, a disease state. Where do you see these membrane transporters in that type of thing and, and as a case example? Do you find that the membrane transporters are more able to predict an ineffective drug or can they predict toxicity? What happens? Yeah, to so both, both, both. So for example, there may be a particular transporter um, that is in the kidney. Let's say a drug causes kidney toxicity. There's a particular transporter in the kidney um, that's bringing that drug into the kidney, whereas, let's say it's an anti-cancer drug, whereas in the tumor, that transporter isn't there. So you can differentially either develop drugs to target the transporter in the tumor and not the one uh, in the kidney, or you, know, you can look for genetic susceptibility alleles that may sit on the kidney but it won't affect. So you can predict adverse drug events also, and certainly this genome-wide association that came up with uh, OATP, an organic anion transporter for the muscle toxicity. Muscle toxicity also, also non-response. Again, if the transporter's in the target tissue, could also be predicting um, you know, non-response at genetic variation there. So yes, one more question. Oh, um, I was going to also go back to something you had mentioned earlier about um, pharmaceutical companies having all these patient samples from failed trials. And I was wondering if there's, um, it, you know, how they make those available, if at all, um, whether they publicize that they have certain types of samples, because it seems like oftentimes researchers have more of looking to a specific disease and those samples would be really useful, but it's just not known that they're available. Yeah, so, I mean, it's not known. You, I mean, for me, I can't get, I couldn't get what, what drugs are failed. I, I could search forever. I can't get it. But, you know, we are engaged in some conversations now with people that are head of the genetics departments in a couple of the companies, and it would be really not, and they are, you know, I, I feel like they are interested in using these samples and not letting them just stockpile there also. So if we can find ways where we could use them, for example, to predict drug-induced liver toxicity or kidney toxicity for failed drugs, that would be fantastic. So I do feel there's got to be a lot of talking, and they have to feel safe that you know it's not going to somehow hurt their stocks or whatever. Um, and then I think partnerships like that could could develop. So maybe I'm naive, but I think so. Yes. Um, it was also interesting when you mentioned putting these um, DNA arrays in your medical records because I think. Health information technology is a very big topic on the right now, and I, I feel like there isn't that much discussion around having genomic information in the health records and how that's going to actually happen. So I guess my question is, you know, if we have SNP tests, you know, across a, a given population, um, how prepared is the health information technology infrastructure to apply that into that kind of context? You know, is there a certain standardization across? your kind of scientific community in terms of how you can present genetic information and then, you know, is the HAT system able to say, to notice when there's a medical, a, a yeah. DNA array in the health record and be able to pull that information? No. I mean, I think not. I think it's not, we're not near prime time here. It has to, that, all those, uh, have to, standardization, et cetera, and accessibility have to be developed. I don't think it's there yet. Uh, not, not to my knowledge, because you but know. Is that something that the scientific community is? 
they're interested in because as we do research in these, like, like when we partner with Kaiser, of course, you know, we're interested in getting electronic medical records so we can find the patients who didn't respond to metformin, for example, and then at some point putting in the genomic information so that we can guide therapy. So, yes, it's down the pipe. We're in the discovery phase right now, but yes, something we should be thinking about. One more question. I'll just see a few stock articles in the New York Times. <laughs> One of my friends sent it to me. Was that like yesterday or the day before? Yeah, I got a I got a link, you know, when I landed, you know, in Baltimore yesterday. So, so I'm wondering what what you think about that. Basically, I mean, it's coming from a pretty major leader in this area, saying that you know there's really no reason to believe that there's any benefit from using the genomic information. Well, okay, so I didn't read the article, but I can comment on what you've just said. So, <laughs> so what you, I mean, I think I'm showing you that the research is moving along pretty well. You know, there's a lot of discoveries being made. I mean, I feel like we're just overwhelmed with the kinds of discoveries, all those genome-wide association studies. You know, now we have to get into mechanism, et cetera, and what puts people at risk for disease as well as variation in drug response. And there have been things like FDA label changes, which are changing therapy. The example I gave with warfarin, that example I hear that they, third party payers are considering very seriously about paying for those tests. So, um, yeah, I guess I feel that we have made progress. Yes. One of the, um, one of the benefits of uh, doubling the NIH budget uh, was, as uh, you mentioned, is of the sequence of the Yeah. Is this area of research one of or the best major example of? Uh, yeah. Practical benefits of that sequencing? Yes, I mean, gosh, I mean, the only way we could resequence OCT1 or any gene that we want to um, was to have the Human Genome Project up there so we knew every gene in the genome and even the gene desert. So, yes, this area, of course, benefits enormously. Those SNP chips, now they're at a million SNP chips so they can revisit. Once you've got the DNA sample, you have the cases in control. When a new technology comes out, you can apply it on that sample. So we can keep learning from the existing clinical trials. So yeah, the Genome Project, we couldn't go without it. I mean, we use it every day in our research in the HapMap Project to determine haplotypes. That's key because if you find a SNP that associates with a disease, that SNP could be linked to two other SNPs. It might not be that SNP that's actually causing the disease. It's something that goes along with it. They're carried together on one chromosome. So that, again, we're getting all that information from the hat map and from NIH dollars, so. It seems like there's categories of drugs that are kind of infamous for being hard to know what drug you find on something, antidepressants, the hypertension meds, and it, trial and error, try that has always didn't work against yeah. that. Like, do you know whether those kinds of variations are probably due to genetic things that so my own personal feeling is there's a lot of genetics behind hypertension. It runs in ethnic groups. It runs, you know, like my mother's Filipino. There's a whole group of them that have a particular kind of hypertension. And so, so I do feel there's a lot of genetics behind hypertension and discovering those will be important. I think the reason we don't see it in that test and nothing showed up is because there are multiple causes of hypertension. You know, if they just took the Filipinas, like my mother, with their hypertension, they might have had a hit. But they combine them together with the African Americans who have hypertension and the white folks that have hypertension because they're, you know, other, other things. And so then they don't get a hit because it's too diluted. You're, you're combining things together. It's like as if you combine the diabetics with the heart disease people, you know, and you're not going to find it. So, so I feel there are genetic reasons. I feel that phenotyping and carefully the clinical, looking at the clinical case will be very important. So some of these other biomarkers that are not genetic biomarkers, but for example, what you carry in your serum or your salt level or, you know, who knows, your glucose level, some of those might help categorize diseases a little bit, you know, better, and then you can pull out the genetic markers. So I do feel we need to use other information sources. Yes. I, I aid to be supporting a whole lot of hypertension 
research. And ultimately, a doctor who's trying to figure out do you need a big water or a <laughs> or something else. Right now, do they have something to go on that kind of tells them? <laughs> I don't think they have sort of, you know, if the person is this and that, give them this. But it's not, not so brilliant, you know. So, yeah, it, that does need a lot of work as to what therapy goes along with the, the high blood pressure. Trial and error, bad news. Especially, I think you're often on the error side, so. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.